How Video Games Are Made The Development, Design, and Creation of Slay the Spire What makes a good game? Is it art? Code? Animation? Sound? Or perhaps it's... In this video, we'll go through the development, design, and creation of Slay the Spire, exploring and breaking down not only its development, but also many of the game mechanics, designs, and techniques that you can use and implement when creating your own games. Slay the Spire fuses card games and roguelikes together to make an extremely fun and very addictive single-player deck builder. In Slay the Spire, the player, through one of four characters, attempts to ascend a spire of multiple floors created through procedural generation, battling through enemies and bosses. Combat takes place through a collectible card game based system, with the player gaining new cards as rewards from combat and other means, requiring the player to use strategies of deck building games to construct an effective deck to complete the climb. Slay the Spire has been well received. In fact, even while still in early access, it sold well over 700,000 copies on Steam alone and was one of the top 100 most played games on the platform. It has also been nominated and won several accolades throughout the years, with PC Gamer giving it the Best Game Design Award for 2019 and IGN naming it the Best Strategy Game of 2019. And while Peter Whalen's Dream Quest is considered to be the first digital roguelike deck building being released three years before Slay the Spire's original early access version, to many, Slay the Spire is considered to be the game that popularized the genre. Development Slay the Spire was the first game developed by the Seattle-based indie game studio Megacrit and has achieved both critical and commercial success. Megacrit has stated, their initial goal with Slay the Spire was to fuse the concept of a roguelike game with deck-building games like Dominion. The game was also inspired partially by the Netrunner collectible card game. Slay the Spire was the brainchild of Anthony Giovanetti and Casey Yano, who met in college while getting their computer science degrees. After working in the software industry for a few years, they reconnected and started to work on Slay the Spire. The game was made with LibGDX. For those unfamiliar, LibGDX is a free and open source game development application framework that allows for the development of desktop and mobile games. It also has cross-platform support for Windows, Linux, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and WebGL. Giovanetti and Yano worked on Slay the Spire for two and a half years before launching it into early access in November of 2017 and was officially released on Steam in January 2019. It took a couple of weeks for it to gain a following, and when it did, the players came from a market all around the world. In an interview, Giovanetti stated, This genre basically wasn't around when we launched Slay the Spire. I have been a lifelong card game player that also loved playing roguelikes. It seemed to me that deck building and roguelikes was a particularly strong mechanical pairing, and I created a design document for Slay the Spire while working in the software industry. As they were developing the game, Giovanetti and Yano spent a long time designing the cards in Slay the Spire and went through years of playtesting until they were happy with the way it played and how the cards were balanced. Giovanetti said, Our process was to brainstorm thousands of different card designs and cut down to the designs that we felt had the most impact. For us, it was all about rigorous and extensive playtesting and iteration. Design More than simply a deck builder and card battler like Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone, Slay the Spire is a deck building roguelike dungeon crawler. When you begin the game, you pick one of four varied and unique characters and begin the game with a very basic set of cards in your original deck. Aesthetics aside, each character also has a unique set of cards that you must unlock, purchase, or win throughout your playthrough. As you work your way up the spire, you'll fight increasingly difficult monsters to acquire a randomized selection of new cards that slowly build your deck into something better. Slay the Spire has an addictive loop of experimenting, dying, 
and growing for the next run. Being a roguelike, apart from unlocking a few new cards and collectible relics as you play, you never actually get stronger from one run to another. Instead, with each playthrough, you just get smarter, developing and testing tactics on how to best utilize your cards and items to defeat enemies that were seemingly impossible to beat on your original encounter. Slay the Spire also enables game progression during losses as well as wins. In terms of game design, this is done mainly to reduce the frustration of losing by providing a means of progression even when players are losing. This makes players feel that their time spent playing was not wasted even if they didn't manage to overcome the final obstacle. In Slay the Spire, you earn experience points based on your accomplishments and how far you progress in a run, whether or not you win. Those experience points for each character eventually unlock new cards that can be used in future runs. The brilliance of Slay the Spire's design shines most with its cards and the extra layer of depth each one adds to the game. The cards in Slay the Spire mainly fall within these six categories. Front End Damage Cards Front End Damage Cards are cards that mainly deal damage to your opponent. Scaling Damage Cards Scaling Damage Cards are cards that mainly deal less damage up front but more and more damage over time. Front End Defense Cards Front End Defense Cards are cards that mainly block damage to your character or reduce an enemy's attack instead of just blocking. Scaling Defense Cards Scaling Defense Cards are cards that mainly improve your block as the fight goes on or for each of the enemy's subsequent attacks. Buffer Cards Buffer cards are cards that make your other cards better, or an active ability that contextually gets better with preparation. Utility cards Utility cards are cards with a specific ability other than attack, defense, or buff. Slay the Spire combines the card mechanics with the fact that the player has a limited energy and card draws. In each turn, the player is forced to choose between playing aggressively, defensively, or strategically. Since the player's health doesn't automatically regenerate at the beginning of each encounter, playing aggressively and trying to end the fight as soon as possible comes with the drawback of not having enough health to win the next battle. On the other hand, playing defensively can lead to long, drawn-out battles, which for some, can slowly zap the fun out of a playthrough. Playing tactically, however, can offer the best of both worlds, but for this, players will need to intelligently design their decks, taking advantage of the synergy between each card and the character's unique abilities. What can we learn from Slay the Spire's game design? Roguelike games are truly a unique experience. There is no definitive end to most of them. Although there are goals to achieve along the way, essentially, they are meant to be infinitely replayable. However, you can't simply rely on a genre type to keep players engaged and wanting to spend their time playing your games night after night. When designing games, it's vital to find ways that can add replayability while adding little to no additional assets, levels, or characters. This holds especially true when creating games as an indie, solo developer, or with a small team. While many games seem to overvalue winning in terms of progression and experience points, Slay the Spire's approach rewards players fairly for losing and for winning, which tells players that their time spent in the game was valued no matter the outcome. This encourages new players as well as returning players because there's no pressure to win in order to get the best bang for your buck. Simply put, Slay the Spire rewards the players from the longer they play the game, instead of simply rewarding the player for beating the game. Characters Slay the Spire's deck-based combat allows for a much different gameplay experience between characters. While in most standard roguelikes, the characters typically play similarly to one another. When designing and creating characters for your game, remember, it's far more important to think of gameplay variation 
than simply the look of the character. Take into consideration the different playstyles of your players and use that as a base for new characters. Something you would think about when designing characters is if each character were represented by simple stick figures, would players be able to distinguish between one character from another? For most games, many players would much rather have fewer characters that play different than a bunch of characters that simply look different. Enemies Slay the Spire features a wide gamut of enemies with varying abilities. Its varying enemy types reinforce the strategic element of the game, forcing players to use different card combinations and strategies in unique ways in order to defeat them. Much like playable characters, when designing enemies, variation goes far beyond mere aesthetics. Enemies should act as a way to not only challenge the player, but also force them to explore new strategies or gameplay variations and mechanics. Graphics In terms of graphics, while Slay the Spire is not ugly by any means, it's not the most graphically inspiring game, even from a 2D standpoint. That said, much like the original Minecraft, the developers understood engaging gameplay and mechanics can easily trump beautiful visuals any day of the week. Slay the Spire maintains a consistent look throughout its cards, characters, environment, and UI. Despite you or your team's aesthetic abilities, in many cases, consistency in visuals is far more important than having the best or most realistic graphics. Graphic inconsistencies are usually noticeable to the player and can easily break the immersion of your game. And though visual consistency when developing and designing games with no or very few artists can sometimes seem impossible, especially if you're forced to heavily rely on the asset store or marketplace for any, if not all, of your art assets, keep in mind, visual consistency isn't about one or a group of artists creating all the art or art assets for your game. It's more about the assets feeling like they could all be part of the same world. Balance In Slay the Spire, there is no useless card. Even cards that appear to have little to no effect, if paired with another card or ability, that card can make the difference between winning or losing an encounter. This is an intelligent design mechanic that's created and maintained by the synergy of each card, along with a player's unique ability or attribute. While in most games, developers want the player to feel far more powerful than the average enemy or NPC, for some types of games and genres, this isn't the case. For games such as card games, be they digital or physical, or competitive player versus player games, it's vital to make sure the balance between the player and each element of the game remains consistent. In strategic and competitive games, it's important that there is no single dominant strategy that the player could always do or use. Instead, we should always give the player multiple ways to overcome any problem and or opposition. Retrospective Slay the Spire takes some of the best parts of deck building games, roguelikes, and dungeon crawlers and mixes them into a wholly new and extremely satisfying package. It encourages experimentation, gives you time to make mistakes, and will challenge you immensely as you navigate your way through floor after floor of entertaining puzzle-like fights. And while Slay the Spire is a fun and great game, it also offers many lessons in game design that you can and should consider implementing when designing your current or next game project. As game developers, we should treat losing as a valid way to experience our games and give players the same level of satisfaction for having played in the first place. We should be designing for how fun it is to lose as much as how fun it is to win. The idea that winning should feel great and losing should feel bad is outdated. We need to make losing feel satisfying too, so that players don't just hate the game and give up, but come back to it with renewed knowledge and determination.
Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be the first to see this and many other tutorials, game development tips, interviews, and free game asset giveaways.